AI, Web3, this, that, creator, con- like whatever. At the end of the day, really, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. What matters is just the application. What is the one product that is going to come out? How are they going to leverage this technology? And can it connect? Can it scale? Welcome to Games Growth with Uptick, a podcast about the discipline of scaling digital games. We speak with industry experts and investigate trends to highlight the strategies, technology, and tactical methodology to profitably grow your game to massive global audiences. If you're interested in learning more about us, visit us at uptick.com. My name is Andrew Agosta, Director of Marketing here at Uptick, and joining me today are my co-host, Warren Woodward, co-founder of Uptick. And our guests, Andrew Green, co-founder and CEO of Storygrounds. And... Josh Liu, partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Josh and Andrew. Excited to have you. Andrew, I don't know if you know this, but you have the hat trick. You are now the first guest to be on the Uptick podcast three times. So congratulations. So that is the biggest achievement in your career, I think. Thank you, Adapali. <laughs> is there a special uh, badge? <laughs> we have an NFT that we're minting. Um, <laughs> um, awesome. Well, thank you for joining us, Josh. Very excited to have you here. We have a really interesting conversation to go over today. We'll be talking about VC investing and its impact on gaming in the present and future. Josh, you're at A16Z, one of the preeminent venture capital firms in Silicon Valley, throughout the world. And Andrew, you have a background in VC and you're working on a new startup with VC backed startup. And so I think you guys have an interesting yin and yang that we can talk about this conversation overall. So I think we just jump right in. Let's get to you, Josh, first. Can you tell us just a bit about yourself, your background, and what you're doing these days? Yeah, totally. Well, I wasn't always a VC. I joined A16Z in September of last year. So it's almost been a year. My background, I'm a games PM and I actually got my start in the growth area. So I joined the games industry 2009 as a growth PM at a company called Playdom. We were making MySpace and Facebook games. My whole job was to basically reverse engineer the Facebook algorithm for fiends and quests and all those things to be able to send more monthly accounts to people. Um, so if you got a lot of those early on, you can blame me on the team. Thank you. And I went to Scopely. I was the first full-time employee there. That was a wild ride. And I was at Zynga for a long time as a PM. Ended up leading the PM discipline there. So running the With Friends franchise, or is it Friends, and a bunch of other smaller casual titles. And I made the leap to mid core core. I was at Blizzard Entertainment running a business function for all of their new stuff, including Diablo Mortal, a couple other mobile titles, but also uh, like UIP and I was at Meta, yes. the GM of a project called Horizon Worlds, which is sort of like their UGC VR metaverse project. And then I came here. So now I'm a partner on the A16Z games team. It's a $600 million fund dedicated to the games industry. We're just starting out. I think the fund started last year officially. And so it's been a fun ride. Awesome. I'm really excited to dig into all that content. I think there's a lot to talk about about the fund. Andrew, can you tell us a bit about your background and what you're doing these days? Sure. I've been in games for 20 some odd years for a while, like gosh, in a variety of positions. I moved though from community and marketing when I was in console games. This is like, I started in Ticket Interactive in like 2000, I think. And then I was at Atari and Electronic Arts working on console games that were not connected to the internet and then started to get connected to the internet. Uh, it was very fun to, you know, be part of like community management early on when people were like, they're talking about our games on the internet. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> like let's talk back. And then worked on games like launching Dead Space with some really awesome folks, Electronic Arts, Dead Space 2, some other really cool games like Spore and stuff like that. I eventually went into more of the product arena. I was at a Facebook Canvas games company called Lollaps that had a lot of really early talent and had a really awesome game called Ravenwood Fair. And then went and worked Tiny Co where I partnered with the CEO to help operate a 170 person studio. First, we did a lot of like tiny games. It was one of the first free to play smartphone gaming companies like in the world. We built a lot of critical infrastructure for Android. We did Family Guy the Quest for stuff. We were very early in the IP game. We basically invented the whole event licensing strategy of like licensing content for short events and additional IP and narrative and marketing and stuff like that. So that was a really great run. We sold the studio to Jam City and Netmarble. I left after Harry Potter. Hogwarts Mystery shipped. I actually eventually also joined Andreessen Horowitz and did a lot of work with games focused investments prior to the fund launching. Uh, eventually I went to Stillfront as an SVP of growth, 
and really just wanted to get back to building again and uh, co-founded Storygrounds. Awesome. I think that's two of the most robust and wide-reaching intros we've ever had of guests on the show at the same time. I think this going to be a really fun one today. <laughs> awesome. You guys have yeah. seen seen some stuff. <laughs> that have been many, really many different vantage points. So you guys have seen quite a bit. I think it's a really interesting place to start is just where are we now? And so I guess just to start with you, Josh, what's the current macro state of the game market overall? Maybe this is like a little rah-rah investor, but you look at the games market, which look at the raw numbers, the games industry continues to grow. A little bit of a sort of a post-COVID pullback as people were excited to go back outdoors or whatever, but the game industry continues to grow. We've been really, really excited to watch a couple of really big launches in recent times. Everything from Tears of the Kingdom to most recently Baldur's Gate 3. We had a portfolio company launch Paleo, which is a cozy MMO into beta very, very recently. And so it's been really, really cool to see new games launching people with an insatiable appetite to continue to play games. And we're really excited about what we're seeing. And maybe the one other thing to add is we continue to see the games industry expand. You know, we're excited to see new hardware launching from Apple and its impact on potentially XR games. We're excited to see car industry get into games. We're excited, of course, about generative AI and its impact on games. I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely exciting times. I think I have a little bit of a different perspective, just for maybe coming from the entrepreneurial side, but I, I don't disagree with Josh. I think it's really exciting times, like still growing an industry. The incumbents have a ton of cash. Big tech still has a ton of cash. So a lot of growth potential for the industry as a whole. I do think that we are seeing specifically in the dynamics of venture capital now and what's being invested in, how it's being invested in, I think is extremely healthy and I think healthier in that there's still a lot of capital coming in, but we're definitely away from some exuberance that was absolutely yeah. bonkers through 2021 and 2022. And like I think it's almost like all of the excitement that Josh is talking about hit a bit of an insane fever pitch. Yeah. And now I think we're in a reality where there's a lot of early stage investing across tons of categories like what Josh was talking about. But I think it's starting to become like a healthier environment for everyone and not just uh, like overstated exuberance, which I think is, is good, actually. Yeah, that kind of mirrors, Andrew, you touched on kind of where I wanted to go next, which was it feels like we're at a real inflection point right now in gaming investment and big new games shipping there was this exuberance period, wild investments around Web3, around creator platforms and games, a lot of the trends I'm sure audience is familiar with. And then it felt like late last year, early this year, there was like an extreme overreaction where just like projects were being canceled left and right, major layoffs, at like gaming company after gaming company. And it does feel like the dust has kind of settled on that again now. People are starting to talk and find about bigger projects again. You guys are probably both closer to it than we are, though. Um, we usually encounter these game teams when they're getting closer to shipping their products. So I'm curious what both of you see a little closer to the front lines. Like, does it feel like, A, do you agree with that narrative of like we had kind of like an extreme overreaction and now we're getting back to projects being funded? And what do you think are the driving factors of these shifts? Maybe I can start. You got to keep in mind, I joined the VC world in September of last year. So sort of at the tail end of when things were the exuberance that you described. I didn't get to live through that necessarily. But, you know, maybe putting on my operator hat for a moment, because that was, you know, most of my career, I think that for a lot of games companies, this is particularly true during COVID, you know, the numbers during COVID are really good. People were continuously online. They were retaining, they were monetizing. And so businesses looked really good. And I think that as a result of that, maybe some teams spent more on headcount or more on marketing than they normally would. And inevitably, when there's a pullback, a macro shock to the market, it's an opportunity to look at your P&L and try to understand what is a persistent lever of growth versus like a temporary lever of growth. And so the pendulum swing that you're describing, I think is just like a very normal correction for a lot of teams. I'm speaking sort of like as a big company operator in that instance, but you can imagine that to be true with some startups too when funding was a little bit easier and when all of your comps were growing really, really quickly, it's very difficult not to feel like you're at an arms race for talent, you're at an arms race for impressions on your marketing dollars. And so I think a lot of that was really absent. So maybe what you're seeing just to set Yeah. Do we also think, and Andrew, I'll go to you for this because I've seen you post some good rants related to this online. 
Do we also think that there are some things that the investment world got wrong about the last era of gaming, like some strategies and bets that didn't pan out as expected? I wouldn't say like VC got it wrong. Like I wouldn't <laughs> say that because like even Josh is alluding to like paleo shipping and like yeah. a lot of really great things happening in the space and traditional games. I do think that the thing that did happen is we had a macro environment in which there was just a lot of free and cheap capital. And we had a marketing environment that was just one in which everyone could market to each other. Founders could market to talent. VCs could market to founders. Founders could market to VCs. VCs could market to LPs. LPs could market to whatever. You know, it's just like everyone was, was just at a fever pitch because I think of some of that COVID action. You saw what was happening with Web3. It was really exciting. It still is really exciting. You know, a lot of people like to shit on Web3 now. I like to shit on Web3 a bit here and there now, but it's nuanced, right? It's extremely exciting technology. Right. So is AI. So is XR. So is a bunch of other like really small changes and shifts that are happening all around mobile and elsewhere. But the problem was really just that macro environment and the amount of capital that was just flooding into the system. And so I don't think it was that people got it wrong. I think that it just got too easy, it got yeah. way too easy. And when that capital, when that macro pulled back, the lights kind of turn on and everyone was standing there smiling, but naked. And we had to take a little stock. So I don't think that anyone got anything wrong. I think it was just the level of exuberance at the time. And then we're now getting back to this more sober, more responsible form of work. And I think you're seeing that in a lot of things, but I think it's healthy and I think it's creating really awesome circumstances that are better than building in that exuberance. I think building in that exuberance is bad for everyone. I think it's bad for VCs. I think it's bad for founders. I think it's bad for employees. I think it's bad for everybody. I think this type of environment is so much better for building. Yeah, I agree with most of it. The one area that is kind of my soapbox that I feel like a lot of, and this is not specific to VC, but a lot of the market got wrong about game studios and we're kind of seeing over the last, I don't know, six years or so come home to roost is just understanding the relationship between investment and growth and how that pans out over the long term. There was a lot of growth stories that seemed very tied to, okay, well, we'll keep scaling up investment. And obviously I come from a user acquisition perspective, but you know, seeing top line revenue numbers grow and assuming that eventually that would all pan out. But closer to the trenches, you could see that so many of these projects were just buying at a loss and kind of like running this hamster wheel to keep getting more investment or for exits of founders. But a lot of these products ultimately proved to not be super profitable. And I think that's maybe the one area where just like the new economics of free to play being dominant and like how you scale a free to play business effectively. That's the one thing that I tend to fixate on that I feel some of the market got wrong. I just, I don't view it as the market. I view it as the marketing that I was just talking about. Yeah. People leverage it. I be, Josh, how many times did, Storytelling. did a team come to you yeah. with numbers in your career and told a narrative with those numbers about the health of their game or whatever, and you were like, you looked at those numbers and you were like, I don't think these numbers are saying what you think they're saying. And it takes a mind, it takes a PM like Josh, or it takes, right. you know, and it takes people that, but if you don't know that stuff and you're just getting those numbers, it's part of that marketing. Like you're just going to get hit, but I wouldn't put that fault entirely on all the VCs. I think it's the ones that might not have the information they need to make those decisions well, but you need to be smart. You need to know the market. And by the way, that's not unique to this era. I got my start back in the MySpace Facebook games boom. And, you know, there was a wave of consolidation after that boom where you had a lot of companies sell for amazing top line multiples. But if you actually peeked under the hood and looked at sort of you know, EBITDA and how sustainable the business was, it didn't look at, you know, anytime there is, you know, a big sort of like wave, you're going to have acquirers or yeah, you know, stuff like that that just that just aren't familiar with the numbers. I can tell you that at least from an investment standpoint, like I've only been here a year or whatever, but at least for our firm, we are looking at stuff very, very closely. So you yeah, know, all of the things that you guys care deeply about, understanding ROAS and the slope of the sort of like deterioration curve, all of those things you know, matter deeply to at least us. And, and I know it, it, it matter to other investors that we've talked to as well. Yeah, those are good points, Josh. And, you know, credit to A16Z, definitely not lumping them in with the greater investment community here because you guys are both proof of 
the most successful funds hire people that have the relevant backgrounds and expertise that don't just come purely from the finance world, but have shipped games, have done performance marketing that understand game economies. And I think we see the big difference in the results of how entities like A6 and Z have panned out over this era versus funds that came from outside of gaming and wanted a piece of the fervor. So let's look a little bit to the future. What I want to understand is we saw the Web3 era, big boom, lots of VC investment. A lot of those companies are taking write downs now, consolidating, trying to figure out business models. Talk a little bit about that and understand how does that relate to the VC investment? First things first, do you agree with the sentiment, Josh, that people are not funding Web3 with the exuberance that they were a year ago? And if so, what's the rationale for that? And what is the next stage of investment? What are the things that you think are exciting going forward? Sure. Well, hard for me to say because I joined sort of at the tail end of that wave. So I didn't get to see a lot of this, of course. I think maybe there's a couple of things going on. One is, at least based on the anecdotal evidence that I see, there's just fewer Web3 founders now than there were before. And so it's a chicken or egg thing. You don't know exactly what's sort of causal versus, you know, but there are fewer founders to fund. And so that's like one obvious reason why there's like less Web3 funding going on. I also think that a lot of investors have gotten to understand sort of like, you know, what makes for a really great Web3 team, what makes for a really great Web3 thesis. And where maybe at the very beginning, it was all theory, you know, now after the first wave of companies, investors are starting to see sort of, you know, what works and what doesn't, and what are the theses that actually sort of panning out. And so there is a narrowing focus. That's maybe another thing, but we have a Web3 team. They're very, very active. And I think there's still a ton of optimism about the space. And so Maybe if there's a broader pullback, that may be happening. But you know, I can tell you that at least from our perspective, our Web3 team is super, super active. They're doing all kinds of things with founders from all over the world. So we're not seeing that as much. No. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think we are a little biased because we're talking to games teams who are trying to break into mainstream markets. And so they're a couple years into their journey, whereas you guys are sometimes a little earlier. Andrew, I think you have a really interesting perspective on this because you raised a Web3 game company in the middle of all the turmoil and growth. Can you talk about how this has been over the last year and a half and what you're doing with your business now in order to make sure that you continue to scale into the future? Yeah, for sure. I believe that just in general in the market, right, if you think about the market macro from a games perspective, there is a major pullback, right, in just overall amount of capital being deployed. And I think that's just due to people being responsible and tightening and trying to ensure that they make the right bets and that everyone has as much possible chance for survival as they can have. Right. The overall market in, you know, it was like 5.3 billion, I think, in 2022 in terms of VC investment, we'll be lucky to hit half that for 2023. So that's like, you know, we're just chopping the entire amount of capital going into the market in half. So that's real and that's going to affect Web3. I think going to our narrative specifically, I mean, it was an amazing journey going in with like real exuberance, real optimism, and then really building in that space. And recognizing that the things that we cared about, they're part technological, but what, what we cared about is collaborative storytelling and building right. tool sets that allow people to be creative and that really lower the barrier. People always talk about low code, no code, this thing, not like how do you actually create real no barrier to entry to creativity? People don't realize like TikTok is like an extremely low barrier to creativity, right? So when you think about it in like interactivity, you talk about like asset pipelines, narratives, all this type of stuff, it starts to get extremely complicated. That's what we care about is figuring out how to make people feel creative in a somewhat interactive space, even if it's more like passive media, uh, like web comics. So that's what we were exploring. I'll be honest, like crypto ended up becoming a real encumbrance to that journey. Right. It, 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 there's a lot of things that were really exciting about it. We were excited about the bottoms up excitement that can be created and the fact that a bunch of community members could come together and really desire to build something together. The issue was that the technology, all it did was alienate a lot of people, create a ton of friction yeah. and um, make it so that you were really obfuscating that exciting aspect of what we wanted to do. And then the shittiest thing I learned, unfortunately, was that a lot of people in the space don't actually give a shit. They're just speculating. They just want to be part of exciting projects early so they can see their bets go up and dump them on people who come in later. And unfortunately, there's still a lot of that in the market. So we have hundred percent. Yeah. I like, but the thing is, is like, let's say, okay, that's mm -hmm. what makes the market like not as appetizing to 
consumers or they see that they don't really understand it, et cetera, et cetera. Let's extrapolate that from the technology and the rails and all the exciting use cases and the fact that there are people that are creating tons of like we're in the bear of the bear right now. And there are people that are just minting for fun. Like there's like 300,000, 400,000 consumers out there that are just minting moments, minting pieces of content just because they want to own them digitally. That's a new behavior. It's not all bad. It's a burgeoning technology field. It's just, again, that exuberance came earlier. A lot of the behaviors around speculation, a lot of people thought there was going to be more application sooner. We as a company had to then say, you know what, there's a better way for us to get to our mission, which is to give people simple tools. But later, like there's a ton about blockchain technology that still could be applied, but we don't need to talk about it. Like no one goes out to market right now as a games company and is like, we're on Unreal. Come like play our, you know, we're, you know, we're using Firebase. It's rad. Like, you know, like no one says that. Like no one's like Havoc physics engine. Like it's just like, you know, like people, it's just a game. Like no one, no one wants to know about the tech. Yeah, stop talking about that stuff. Yeah, stop yeah. talking about the tech. Like, who gives a shit? Like, yeah. so it's like, yeah. So the future, I think, is one where there is always going to be like, you know, like, there's always going to be speculation. There's always going to be building. But I think the applications are going to come. And I think they are going to be extraordinarily powerful. I just think it was exuberant early. And we were in that really like, cheap capital market. And it just got a little crazy. So we're moving forward. And it- Going after our core mission again, we still believe that we can scale also like potentially in Web3 eventually. You know, so it's, it's more just how good is our platform, right? That's really what it comes down to, not what the tech is. I was just going to say in this market, you know, the people that are building are the true believers and are, are the ones that are really focused on making really great use cases, doing interesting things with the tech. And so my personal expectation is that actually, you know, a lot of really great sort of like use cases are going to come out of this market. Yeah. Hundred percent, Josh. That's actually kind of what I was going to say. The blessing of the current state of Web three crypto gaming, whatever you want to call it. We talk to a handful of new game teams every week, and during the bull market, it was horrible. Like the products were horrible. It was just like, how quickly can you get to market? What's the most M of the MVP you can actually ship out the door? And clearly, people just trying to capitalize on this fervor. The quality bar, uh, now I get excited when I talk to a Web3 team because I know if they're shipping now, they, as just as Josh said, they suffered through this. They're not in this for a short-term exit. And I think we saw this reflected not so much in the traditional VC world, but I'd love to kind of deviate just briefly here to kind of like the crypto investment world or crypto native funds. And one thing I noticed, again, being further removed from this is really bad habits for game design incentivized by those funding models. Like these funds... Uh, I talked to a lot of teams that were like, well, we didn't really want to put a token in the game, but all these funds are telling us they won't invest in us unless we put a token in the game. Mm -hmm. Now that time has panned out, we have basically zero examples of a gaming token not collapsing a game economy because it's ultimately there is a, at least my assessment, like a more rapid exit mechanism for investment. I'm just curious, am I off base with that view? It does feel like now anyone building with Web3 Tech is just being treated more like a business and also having to go be assessed as a business more versus like, cool, you guys have a token. We'll invest if we can you know, exit with these parameters. Can I rant for a second on this? Please. And, yeah, I was just ranting. So <laughs> maybe this gets cut because I say something. And I'm this podcast is 90% rant. <laughs> but like having been in the games industry for a while, a founder that I would be excited to work with. And look, it's very easy for me to say because I wasn't part of the investment community during the boom. A founder that I would be excited to work with in the games industry in Web3 would be somebody who has a vision for their game design, has a vision for what the heck they're trying to make and why it'll work, and like isn't doing things because an investor is telling them. And this is like broadly true of any invest. Like, look, if you're a founder right now and you're doing something because you know your VC told you to do it and you fundamentally don't believe in it, then that's bad. Look, I think investors have a lot of good inputs. They see the market. It is their job to understand the macro trends. And to be able to convey those in a way that might be helpful to founders. But if as a founder, you philosophically don't believe in something your investor is saying and you're doing it because you feel like you're forced to, then that suggests maybe not as good of a relationship with your investor as you probably should aspire to have. And so in the case, and Andrew, feel free to push back, but like in the case of like a game studio that is like, you know, thinking about doing some crazy thing with their game 
design economy and forget web three, just like literally anything their investor is telling them to do that. They don't believe it and they do it anyway. That's on them. Right. Right. And, and by the way, like there were lots of patterns that you could see in games before, like, you know, machine zone was before web three and like not that much before, like a couple of years. And you could have just looked at what that economy looks like. And by the way, there have been examples of game economies well before that you could have pointed to. So anyway, this is my rant, but I just no. it feels like a bad excuse to say that like an investor was telling me to do a thing that was dumb and so I did it. Oh yeah, I agree. I, I so I just want yeah, so Josh, it was actually to back you up. Like I completely agree with you. Like it is completely like if okay, the the issue that I see more of is that the founders were trying to figure out what people would put money into. They would just build a pitch to get the money without necessarily knowing what their vision was or how they were going to get there right or having no zero to one experience of having to iterate their way there right and just trying to sell it i put that way more on the entrepreneur than i put that on the investor i actually almost put that entirely on the entrepreneur i could see how there could be investors that are like wink wink nudge nudge do this and like you get the money that sucks i agree with josh like it's on the founders it's like do this because you want to do it because you think it's going to succeed not because you think you're going to raise money founders perspectives on like why they should raise money and the fact that they did raise money a lot between 21 and 2022 or for all the wrong reasons. The incentives are misaligned, right? Because the fact that you had a token that you would sell meant that you could get instant liquidity and all you had to do was hype it up and the VCs could cash out and the founders could cash out within like six months. And that I think provided a very, very perverse incentive. The problem though, the, the only problem that I would bring forward though, that I think is problematic in the VC like founder relationship, even in games that I think is sticking somewhat. I don't think it's sticking for everyone. I think it's sticking for like the one to 3%, maybe just the 1%. It's really probably the 1%. It's just oversized rounds, oversized rounds, oversized valuations also creates the long structure for a lot of companies. Josh, That's the only you... thing I, I push back. And that, you know, it's a new thought actually. Well, Josh, what do you think about that? Do you think that there's an issue with these high valuations, major investment rounds and these companies that don't have really mature products yet? Is that an issue from your perspective? The price of a round is set by the market. Investors don't go out and give a really high valuation just because or whatever. Like, you know, th those are set by the market. Now, there's a separate question of if you give a company a lot of money pre of product market fit, does that create weird incentives? And again, I think the answer is like, it depends. And it depends a lot on the founder, right? Like if the founder goes and takes the money and like burns a lot of it quickly mm -hmm. and in a way that like, you know, doesn't necessarily optimize for product market fit in previous waves, you know, not talking about any recent ones, but like, again, in the Facebook era, like you had Facebook games era, you had like a lot of companies like getting nice offices and doing the things and like before they had product market fit, that's probably like not a good use of raising a big round. But the positive side of raising a big round before product market fit is if the founders are really disciplined about using that, that money in a very targeted way, go and do experiments, build out a small core team of very experienced people who are just like running at figuring out product market fit, then they will be really well capitalized later on to like, you know, pour gas on the fire and to not have to wait to do another round. Or once they have something going, they can hire a bunch of people to like, you know, scale it out really quick. So there are advantages. And again, it's very easy for me as an investor to say it's like on the founders, but it kind of is like as a founder, if you raise a big round, there's lots of ways that you can deploy that capital. And just like an investor who has a responsibility to deploy capital in an efficient, smart, logical, rational way, so do that. Yeah. Just to echo an earlier point, uh, a related thing that we saw as a trend maybe to more flailing projects is they've been given KPI for a potential further investment. That's a reasonable KPI around number of users or around social followings for earlier stage. And it's not that the KPI is unreasonable. It's just we have a user acquisition shop. Most of these things can be gamified. They can be brute forced. You can get your Twitter following to be X following up to any arbitrary number with you know close to zero cost, similar with acquiring number of users for your product. And it's not that they're the wrong KPIs. It's just if you are only focused on direct hacking to answer that KPI to get that next round versus shipping a strong product, building a business, and the KPI being indicative of that, there's only one way that story ends. From what I've seen, the projects never really bounce back once they start going down that rabbit hole of just chasing the KPI for the next round rather than what's healthy for the business. And Back to your point, Andrew, I think that's where the onus really falls on the founder to like, okay, understand like the spirit of this 
this target you've been given, not the literal to keep pushing the ball down yeah. the road. I, I mean, honestly, like, and not to push away from this conversation into trend territory, but I think there is a key trend that is really positive that is also links directly to games VC, and that's speedrun. I think speedrun is extremely positive for the industry and extremely positive for the market. Can we not explain what that is? John, or, John, is it, you know, John, John yeah. Yeah. because I don't think everyone yeah. is going to know what that is. Yeah, yeah totally. So speedrun is our new games and tech industry accelerator. We ran our first cohort earlier this year and really, really liked what we saw. And so I've sort of been tasked to productize it and institutionalize it. And so we're going to run the next cohort. We just announced that applications are open. Uh, next cohort will start in January and run through GDC. And basically, what we're doing is we're taking you know, pre-seed, ultra early stage founders as early as possible, giving them some money. And then you know, we've got a program. It's going to be 10 weeks this time. We have everything from speakers, from industry luminaries. We had, you know, we're at Pincus, my old boss. Come speak with Ilka, Supercell, come speak with Kevin Lin from Twitch, and many others. We have a mentor network. We give all of the founders access to our operating team to sort of just teach them what it's like to be a founder and build a games company from scratch. And so it's been really fun. And uh, yeah, so Accelerator aimed at sort of like very, very early stage companies. Yeah, makes sense. And very of the A16Z model. I think this is a good bridge. Let's talk a little bit about the future in gaming specifically. What are some emerging trends in gaming that you guys both have your eyes on? Are there any interesting game mechanics? What are the sort of macro trends you guys are looking towards overall the next, call it two to three years? Am I allowed to say anything besides generative AI? I mean, you could have something new and you can <laughs> say, or you can just say generative AI. Wait, there's <laughs> something else? I, d- I didn't know there was something else. Also, but like in games specifically, so, I mean, generative AI is obviously going to have a massive impact in games. So I mean, let's just do it. What's the thesis around that? I have a, I, I have a total cop out here. Like I'm just going to cop out of this whole entire time. Like here's my cop out, right? He's <laughs> like, all of the, right. uh, all of these trends, the real, like, yes, AI, Web3, this, that, creator, con- like whatever. At the end of the day, really, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what matters is just the application what is the one product that is going to come out how are they going to leverage this technology and is it going to connect and scale and can it connect can it scale i know we're here to talk about trends and like we can like identify all of them but it's just instead of being like generative ai mid journey is like the only consumer gen ai application creatively that is like kind of generating a bit of a social net runway like things like that it's like where does that fit into gaming i think i'm just gonna go on the record and say i know there's a lot of early stage crazy magic shit happening and like story grounds my company we are looking at leveraging aspects of the technology because i do think it also still is alienating a large part of the audience just like crypto does right it's like what is the application how do you actually build a community around it how do you get people involved how do you scale it what are those actual instances of that? That's what I'm more interested in than the trends. But like, I think there's some cool shit like in and door. Yeah. Josh, I'm sure you have some examples. I would love to talk more about examples than like just trends. Well, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean though. It's like, what are, what are the trends and what does that enable? What types of games are going to exist that wouldn't yeah. otherwise? Well, and just a quick comment before going to Josh for his thoughts here. I mean, Andrew, I think you're kind of touching on what the reality of all these trends are that we get so excited about. Nothing is a panacea. Web3 is not a panacea. AI is not a panacea. At the end of the day, what these technologies end up being is often something far less sexy, which is like, hey, this thing makes my game 10% cooler. This like made me like, make a slightly cooler economy or collectible aspect to the game, or I can create my content in the game 10% easier. And that's not very sexy, but that's often where new technology... Or the lies. irony of mid-journey, which is, oh my God, I'm literally doing magic on my hand computer, <laughs> but like, how is it fitting into my life in a way that is actually changing the way that I like interact mm-hmm. with the world. I'm still on TikTok. I'm still watching TV. I'm not spending all my time on it. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's like, it's like that's what's insane is it's literal magic. And yet it's not actually making that much of an impact yet. So it's just, what's the actual application? Where is it moving? That's what's exciting. And well, you must spend less time than me arguing with ChatGPT. Josh, your <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> here, here are a couple of use cases that I'm excited about. Warren, you were talking about, well, you know, maybe this thing just like makes your game 10% cooler. I'm actually most excited about Gen AI making like games 50 to 90% cheaper to make. Yeah. Yeah. Super exciting. And look, we're a little bit ways off from getting production quality, like 3D assets and meshes into the games or whatever. But like, 
that is kind of the dream and you can sort of yeah. see a steady march towards that. And so coming from you know my the last game that I worked on and ships Diablo Immortal is a two hundred plus million dollar budget. And it's a great game, but like imagine if you could do that in twenty million with a twenty million dollar budget. So what happens? So either people are able to make Diablo Immortals at scale and like way more studios can do that that didn't have access to a four hundred amazing co-development resources from China to help make it happen. Or the big studios actually do projects that today would cost like a billion dollars to make or whatever. And, you know, that's really exciting. And as a gamer, I think we are all excited about that possibility. And, but it's hard to say when exactly that will happen, but we are seeing clear examples all of the time of us marching towards that. That's very exciting. That's one thing. And then there are, even today with the crudeness of the tooling, you can see the very beginnings of some interesting emergent behavior. Zeta, you were joking about arguing with ChatGPT. I mean, there are tens of thousands or more people in products like character.ai who are having real conversations with AI. And there are examples of other products where people are building real relationships with AI. And so something that I always think about is like in Japan and you know some of the sort of like East Asian countries have been ahead of us in terms of people's relationships with technology for a while. So if you just like look at what has become popular over there, relationships with digital humans, VTubing, parasocial relationships with like virtual celebrities. These are all interesting things that are just starting to make their way over and become things here in the West. And I'm old and not cool anymore. And so I don't get to see it on. Don't say that. Don't say that. I think you're pretty cool. So. <laughs> uh, but like those are real things. And then there's like, you know, a million different types of game interactions that I can't imagine yet. I'm excited about the possibility of those, of course, but like we're really long ways away. But the first two that I mentioned, you know, those are here now or very close to now. And you don't have to squint too hard to be able to see you know, those things becoming very real in this case. Yeah, I, bl- I believe. Yeah, I really look forward. No, I was just going to say, I really like your comments, Josh. And I think that's something that I overlook is the value of reducing that gatekeeping, lowering the barrier of entry can't help but think what's happened to the world of broadcast media in the era of Twitch and YouTube and just seeing that collapse. And I really like the vision of that world where we see something similar happen to gaming, where there's those lower barrier of entries and creators with great ideas for gaming don't have to climb those walls in order to see their ideas come to life. So that's a great point. I won't say democratize. (laughs) I know this is a possible question. I almost didn't want to ask it because it's like impossible to answer. But like, does the billion dollar game that is made for 100k crowd out everyone else? Or do you think there's still a pretty diverse and disparate ecosystem with a bunch of different price points for a bunch of different people? I guess it's kind of obvious. It's probably gonna be the second one. But do you think there's any like non-obvious downstream effects of having people be able to create a billion dollar game for 100k or 100,000 million dollar games for 20k? I mean, the- like, think about being a random like C- C-tier game studio. Like you're going to be, it's going to be impossible to get distribution, right? Because like you, everyone's going to be a million of them. I didn't the closest, thing, the closest for catalog we have to that right now is hyper casual, but like that's still like the amount of work that you need to do the organization to actually be successful in hyper casual is insane. But that's the closest catalog we have to that games as content, games as just this like biteable, chewable piece of content versus this like larger thing that is made quicker, faster, better. I think uh, I have a lame answer, which is I have absolutely no idea. It's so far in the future where that is really going to take shape. I think what's more interesting is not necessarily that. I think it's the journey there and how younger generations, young millennials, Gen Z, the way in which they collaborate, the way in which they consume, the scale and size of all of the content experiences that they want, the amount, what the attention span looks like. I think that is happening right now. And I think that's going to dictate more of consumption habits in the future. And I think that people that are building more and more diverse types of content experiences that are more akin to things happening on TikTok. And I don't see enough of that happening. I think that's a really interesting area. I think there's going to be a lot between now and then what does this future content look like? How is it consumed? How is it monetized? I think it's very hard because there's so much new forms of interactivity that haven't been deployed yet because we're still doing honking big giant games the same way we were doing them. But, but that, okay, not to go back to speed run and like bubble, but that's why I like speed run because it gets a bigger, a broader diversity of 
product types, of founder types, of different things funded into the ecosystem, trying things versus that barrier being higher for VC. And that's what I think is great about it and why it's exciting and why I think it ties in really well to the future key trend and why I think it's a real driver because you're not going to get that innovation unless that innovation get funded. They're not getting funded now. Speedrun's helping them get funded. So that's cool. But like, I still think those are going to be the people that build new types of interactions. You're going to see those things and they're going to pop off in like small, medium, big ways. They're going to drive that future forward. I have no idea what it's going to look like. Story grounds. That's what we're trying to do as a company, not to like shamelessly plug my company, pre-register now at storygrounds.com. But it's like, we are trying to like give tools to people to make the friction of creating content easier. Ours is in the form of web comics and manga. It's just, you got to find like, how are people interacting now? And like, what can we do differently? And how can we try things that are different? Because all of the macro distribution has tightened, is changing, and everything is less efficient than it's ever been. So that's valid. I think a lot of the head ringing that we have is because, you know, because we've all been in the games industry for so long, it's like, it's very easy to fall into a pattern of how things should be. I worked for very successful founders in my career. Like Mark Pincus was not a games guy. And he was successful in part because he was not a games guy. You know, Walter Driver at Scopely was not really a games guy and was in part successful because he wasn't. And so that is kind of the hope of Speedrun is like, you know, bringing people who aren't necessarily, you know, have the same big pattern matching that we all have. He's a net good for the games industry and probably a good combination as platforms change, distribution channels change, technology changes. And then maybe just to respond to like the AI thing, you know, people can watch Oppenheimer and be on TikTok today. And <laughs> yeah. those things are not mutually exclusive. And so if you just take this thing to like absurdity, you can have these epics and you can have at the very end of the spectrum, a hyper-personalized game for you. It's the game where if the cost of development is effectively zero, then you can have basically an amazing game where Andrew Green is the hero, all of the people that he hasn't liked in his career are, are all the villains and you could sit, you know, like, you know, punch him and shoot him. And that's a game. And like, that sounds amazing. So this is all speculation far out in the future, but I don't think those things are mutually exclusive. Agreed. Yeah, no, there's a macro trend. I'd love to keep this discussion on, but we are unfortunately at time. Thank you for joining us, Josh and Andrew. Andrew, if someone wants to get a hold of you or learn more about your company or pre-register, where can you do that? So yeah, so pre-register at storygrounds.com. And also you could follow me on Twitter or whatever it's called these days at farming underscore X as in xylophone, P as in piano, and or on LinkedIn, because that's where people apparently like read the stupid things I write, Twitter or X or whatever it's called. I'm not really sure what track and stuff, but try to be there, you know, happy to chat. Awesome. <laughs> Josh, if someone wants to get a hold of you or learn more about Speedrun or A16Z or any of that, how could they do that? Um, there's all links in my socials. So on Zeet, it's going to be at Josh Liu and then, you know, LinkedIn. Just, just hit me up. Always happy to talk about Speedrun. Always happy to talk about anything games related. Yeah. Drop me a link. Awesome. Warren, take us out. Yeah. Thanks so much, Josh and Andrew. This was one of my favorite conversations. And thank you to all the listeners today for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, the podcast is brought to you by our team here at Uptick. Here at Uptick, we do all things to help games grow, no matter where games are growing. With the tech they're being built on, the platforms they're being distributed on, we try to stay on top of that and evolve with the times. We work on PC games, Web3 games, mobile games, and we're very keen on whoever is pushing the envelope for that. So if you're building a rad game of any kind, we don't care what you're building it with, just that it's rad. Reach out to us. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to see if we can help with either our technology or our people. You can reach us on uptick.com. That's U-P-P-T-I-C.com. Talk soon.